All right, hello everyone. It is 10.15, so we are going to get started here in a second. You are currently in web room one. We are about to start outreach campaign to prevent the spread of spiny water fleas. Uh, presenting today is going to be Dr. Valerie Brady. Um, quick uh, logistics before we get started. Uh, if you hover your mouse on the bottom row of commands, you're gonna see a Q&A button. That's where we're gonna be taking our questions throughout the session. Uh, don't feel like you have to wait until the very end to type those questions. You can type them in as we're going through the presentation and then we'll go through the questions at the end. Um, if you're having any problems with um, the technology throughout the talk, use that chat button and I'll try to help you as quickly as I can. Um, I'm also moderating the talk, so uh, forgive me if I am a little bit slow on the chat today. Um, what else? Uh, we're recording this talk, so after the showcase, we are going to be uploading all of our talks to our MESERC YouTube channel so that you can view them later. Uh, as soon as they're all uploaded to YouTube, we will send out a link to all of our showcase attendees so you can watch them as much as you want at home because I know you just can't get enough of MESERC research. Um, so without too much more ado, I'm going to hand it over to Valerie Brady. Um, and here we go. Go ahead, Val, take it over. <laughs> Let's see, you're muted. Oh, there you go. I had to unmute. Every time I share my screen, then all my controls seem to uh, seem to go away. So um, hang on one second. I need to make sure I'm sharing sound. Okay. And Kristen, can you hear me okay? I can hear you great. All right. Thanks, everybody. Um, so this talk is actually going to focus a little less on the research and more on the outreach that we have been trying to do with our findings since we have done the research itself. But I want to start with an overview of the research findings for those of you who haven't heard us before, just to make sure that everybody's on the same page for what we're actually trying to communicate, because that will help you then judge whether or not we've been successful. Um, so just to start off, this project was done as a sort of a combination project between funding from MACERC and also funding from St. Louis County. And the project, um, it, was, it was dovetailed, and you'll see that as I go through the results here. So we were looking at trying to prevent uh, spread of spiny water fleas in Minnesota lakes. And so how do we do that? First of all, just a little bit about the spiny water flea. So, Spiny water flea is a bit different from our other invasive species in that it seems to prefer our less polluted, less affected lakes. So it tends to be in the northern half of the state in our nice clear water, really nice fishing lakes, which um, <laughs> is not a good thing. Uh, so as far as we know, Mill Lacks is still the farthest lake south where the spiny water flea has been found, and it's all the way up to the Canadian border, it's in the Boundary Waters um, and other lakes. Um, so it's a little tiny zooplankton. It's like the size of a grain of rice. And we get a lot of, well, can that really cause big impacts? Unfortunately, with this critter, yes, it can. Um, so here's a, here's a drawing of a, a spiny water flea blown up like I don't know, 100,000 times, a lot. Um, not 100,000, but 1,000 times. Um, so this would be very scary if it was in your nightmare. Um, and if you're a little tiny fish who's trying to find zooplankton to eat, this spine could actually be a pretty scary thing. So that's part of the problem with spiny water fleas. Um, it's really difficult for small fish to eat them because of this spina barb. This is actually evolutionary de evolutionarily developed as a protective device for these spiny water fleas against being eaten. So they can't be eaten well by fish and they're out competing our native zooplankton, the little water fleas that we all are familiar with from biology class. Um, so there are fewer of these native zooplankton that the fish can eat in our lakes. They've been taken over by this guy. And so that sort of short, sort of short circuits the food web. And so other research, not research that we did, but other folks have found 
uh, declines in uh, the native zooplankton, as I said, their biomass declines. So there's fewer of them for the fish to eat. And that has led to fewer and smaller young fish that we care about, like yellow perch and walleye. Um, and so this is why we should care. It, it short circuits the food web. There's less food for the fish to eat um, because Bithotrephes is so difficult to eat. So we had, we all know that there's this great clean, drain, dry campaign out there. And, but it mostly focuses on, you know, your live well and your boat and trailer and things like that. And we weren't sure that spiny water flea is really um, moved about so much by those methods. People who have fished in spiny water flea infested lakes know that spiny water flea can get on your fishing line and your gear. And we had the thought that, you know, this may be one of the ways that spiny water flea is getting spread and we're just not paying enough attention to which angling gear really uh, could be spreading spiny water flea and could be all fouled up with spiny water flea. So we decided to, um, to try to test this out in both St. Louis County and Maserk were interested in funding the research. And so they each funded one component of it on one lake. So what we tested were, uh, surface troll lines. So, you know, they were down under the water, maybe 10, 15 feet. Um, and then a downrigger line, we also uh, trolled along. So that was of just a few feet off the bottom. And we tested what we simulated as a live well, which was a hose running into a plankton net that we pumped water into continuously. And we have um, on the other side of the boat, you can't see it here, we're actually towing a bait bucket just to see what that would do. So if somebody's slowly trolling along, they're trying to keep their bait alive, they've got some surface line out, they've got a downrigger down, they've got their live well going, which of these things would most collect spiny water flea that if they weren't removed could then accidentally be transported to the next lake that the angler went to? So this was our, this was our setup. And when we were doing this, um, we did this in Lake Mille Lacs and uh, funded by Maserk and um, um, Island Lake funded by St. Louis County. And we didn't know at any given time how many spiny water flea would be in the water column. So we had a second boat that followed this first boat. And the second boat had the big standard zooplankton nets on it. And it would stop every so often and drop the big nets down and then just um, collect samples so that we would know how many spiny water fleas were in the water column. Because spiny water fleas kind of go through, like many zooplankton, go through kind of boom and bust cycles throughout the summer. So they may be really abundant one week and not very abundant at all the next week. So um, this little inset map shows that we did a number of transects. Each transect was about a kilometer long. And where the green dots are is where the following boat, the zooplankton test boat, um, would stop and actually take samples to see how many spiny water fleas were in the water column. So as I said, we did this in Island Lake and Lake Mille Lacs, both infested lakes. Um, we also tested uh, daytime versus evening because spiny water fleas, um, even though they have that nice spine, <laughs> that means that fish can't eat them very well, they do come up into the water column more at night um, so that they so that they're less easily eaten by fish and they stay way down toward the bottom during the day to kind of hiding out. So we were wondering if that would make a difference. Like perhaps anglers who are out in the evening, which is a great time to fish, perhaps it was even more likely that their gear would get entangled by uh, spiny water fleas. All right, so as I said, I want to focus more on our outreach. So I'm going to go through our findings quite quickly here. Um, the main takeaway from these two graphs, which are number of spiny water fleas on the gear versus number of spiny water fleas in the water column when we were sampling, is that there's a very strong correlation, which makes a lot of sense. If there are hardly any spiny water fleas in the water column, you're probably not going to entangle them on your angling gear, right? Um, but this also shows that uh, that risk increases basically linearly. Um, so as you get more and more spiny water fleas in the water column throughout the season, uh, you're much more likely to have those entangled on your gear. 
and not a huge difference between daytime and twilight. So that's what the, the second graph shows over here, the twilight sampling. What we found is that it's those trolled lines that really collect spiny water fleas. And so what this shows is um, how, many, how many of the total spiny water fleas on the gear you would remove if you just, if you just cleaned each thing in succession. And what this shows is that if you have a downrigger, that's where a lot of the spiny water fleas are likely to be. And so the most, if you'd only clean one thing, the most important thing would be to clean your downrigger line. If you're uh, trolling um, surface line, those are the next most likely things to get fouled. Now, not everybody trolls. You know, some people are casting and reeling in. It's like mini trolling, right? Because you're pulling your line through the water. And so you, and those of you who've been on spiny water flea lakes know this, you're still going to get spiny water fleas on any line that's cast out and reeled in if there's many spiny water fleas in the column. So just fishing lines in general, you need to clean them off. Now notice that there's a difference here between the downrigger line and the downrigger cable. For some reason, the downrigger cable does not seem to accumulate nearly as many spiny water fleas as the line does. We have a, several theories for that based on you know, the thickness of the cable. And when, they, when the spiny water fleas tangle on the lines, it's that spine and those little, um, those little spikes on the spine that get entangled with each other around the line. And because the lines are thin, that's easy to happen. And a downrigger cable, which is thicker, may not happen as well. I forgot to say that we also, put anchor ropes out. Now we didn't troll anchor ropes because hopefully most people aren't trolling with their anchor out. Um, I have done that on accident, but not intentionally. Um, so we put the anchor ropes to soak. So they covered the whole water column surface to bottom. We just let them sit there while we went and did the trolling. Anchor ropes, because they were stationary and maybe because they were bigger, we don't exactly know why, but we do know we hardly ever found spiny water fleas on anchor ropes. Um, it was a big surprise to me. I thought they would be covered with spiny water flea. Uh, towing the bait bucket, running water through a live well. Also, all these things collected very few spiny water flea. It's really those lines that collected them. And so that's what we need to communicate to anglers is, yes, clean everything possible, but really focus on your lines. That's where spiny water flea accumulate. This was from Lake Mille Lacs, one of our tests you can see all these little um, gelatin masses. Uh, they're all spiny water fleas. So each spine or each dark spot, which is their single eye spot, each spiny water flea has a single eye spot. Each one's a separate spiny water flea. So there are dozens on this um, line that was surface troll. Um, so uh, here's, the, here's the take home, you know, 87 to 88% of everything we ensnared in all tests, we did this multiple, multiple times we're on the fishing lines. So, and here's a picture of a downrigger line right here. You can see there's dozens and dozens of spiny water fleas piled up on that line. So we need to get this message out to anglers. And we've been working on that for the past probably 18 months. How do we get this out to anglers? And our first idea is we're gonna just make stickers that tell everybody what to do. And we're gonna give all the anglers stickers and they can put them on their tackle boxes um, which I was later informed nobody uses anymore, but I did not know that. Um, and that'll be good. It'll get the message out. Everybody will have a sticker. They'll know what to do. We presented this idea to the DNR aquatic invasive species managers, and they're like, you know, everybody does stickers. Can, can you do something else? And their suggestion was give anglers something to use that they can clean the spiny water flea off of their gear using it. Well, that sent us back to the drawing board. What, what can we make? Um, we toyed with you know, little clips that would go on your line and clean the spiny water flea off the line, but we were afraid that would fray the line. And um, that it, even if it didn't, people would be afraid that it would so the anglers wouldn't use it. So then we came up with Spiny wipes. So spiny wipes are actually just Swedish dish cloths. For those of you that haven't used them, they look like a steamrolled sponge. They're about uh, eight inches by eight inches square. They're used for washing dishes. They, um, they're very 
they're almost cardboard like when they're dry, but when you get them wet, they're nice and, and pliable, but they're not as floppy and pliable as other types of cloth. We actually tested, we were in the back hallway of NRRI, Natural Resources Research Institute, where I work, and we laid out lines and we tried all different kinds of cloth. How can you hold the rod under your arm and crank it and still have a hand free with a cloth in it and run that? run that line through that cloth while you're reeling your, rod, your line in on your rod. And cloths that were too floppy didn't work very well. So we, came, so we found out that the Swedish dish cloth, when damp, works best, and we could print on them quite easily. And so you see a printed one here where we uh, came up with, well, we, Kristen, <laughs> Kristen, who is moderating this session, um, came up with the, uh, the words to put on it. And she and Carrie Hansen came up with our design to show what a spiny water flea kind of looks like and what they look like when they're on your line. And you can see that here. They look like all these little spiky things on your line. And so we had a whole bunch of these made and distributed using money from both St. Louis County and Macer. And so at this point, um, we ourselves have had printed and distributed more than 11,000 wipes to a whole bunch of groups who are going to hand them out to anglers and hopefully, hopefully have been uh, this summer. Um, we could not keep up with demand. We didn't have enough money. And so uh, Meg set up, Meg Durr, who's also a MACERC uh, employee, set up a way to help groups order wipes themselves. And so a couple dozen more groups have ordered at least 9,000 more wipes to give away at this point. And so uh, Meg Durr has worked really hard on all of this, spent hours and hours organizing things and on the phone and shipping wipes out to people. Um, and I, you know, probably a month of her time, maybe more, um, doing this. And so that was one of our <laughs> eye-opening messages. It's like we had no idea how much time this would take. It was a great effort. We really need to get the word out there, but we really underestimated the amount of time and person hours it was going to take everybody to, you know, do the designs and get all the distribution and find the groups who could distribute them to anglers on vulnerable lakes and all those sorts of things. And hopefully some of you have seen these wipes getting out there um, this summer. So that was one, uh, probably our, one of our main outreach tools was just we give, every, we give as many people as we can a wipe to wipe off their lines and show them how to use it. But we had to get the word out as well. And so we had proposed that we would make um, PSAs to get the word out. And so we did that. Um, with a lot of help again. So we created two minute, 30 second and 15 second PSA ads. And that, that was a, a collaboration between the uh, UMD videographer, um, Kristen wrote the scripts and then uh, my, te my team went out and, and did the, you, you can't you know video just the research, it just doesn't work that well. So we went out and staged the video for the PSAs to show people what happens when you reel your lines in, how to clean the lines with the spiny wipes, how to use a spiny wipe to like wipe out your bait bucket and wipe out your live well and all that sort of thing. So those uh, ran on TV in Duluth um, last fall. And then Kristen has been getting them out there on Facebook and Twitter and some websites that are hosting them. Um, and so they've reached thousands, hopefully they've reached thousands and thousands of people with this way, uh, this, this method of communication. Um, so I'm going to try to run our 30 second PSA and um, Kristen break in if, uh, if it, the sound doesn't show up. Spiny water fleas are an invasive species that threatens Minnesota lakes. Recent research from the University of Minnesota has shown that lakes with spiny water fleas have fewer and smaller walleye than uninvaded lakes. You can help prevent the spread of spiny water flea by draining all water and wiping down your equipment when you leave the lake. This especially includes fishing lines and reels, live wells, and bait buckets. Learn more at stopspiny.org.
So as you can see, that was to drive traffic to the website that Kristen created for us, stopspiny.org. And you'll notice I'm saying MACERC staff a lot. They really jumped in and helped us. We could not have done nearly as much of this outreach without Kristen and Meg's help. It was, it's been amazing. Um, so Kristen created a great website and um, she also helped us get print ads into magazines and helped us with outreach articles. We've had outreach articles in several magazines and five regional newspapers. And again, uh, most of the, the print ads, you can't put very much on them, right? So again, they drive traffic to the website. So if you go to stopspiny.org, you can download uh, the PSAs for use any place you can get them shown. If you're a, you know, a lake group that's concerned about preventing spiny water flea from getting to your lake or protecting other lakes if you're an invaded lake, um, you can help us get these PSAs out. There's also radio scripts um, to do PSAs for the radio if anybody wants to buy some radio time. The print PSAs that I just showed for use in magazines or newspapers, those are also available. Um, you can find the how to order the spiny wipes. So this is for groups, this is not for individuals. Um, they have to be mass printed. Um, there's fact sheets and our research findings all on the stopspiny.org website, which Kristen actually found for us. She found the name for us and she has written the content for that. Um, so to sum up all the outreach that we've done, um, here it is, <laughs> TV ads, been on the radio, Facebook and Twitter, print ads in magazines and newspapers, outreach articles. Um, between Don and I, we've given at least 10 outreach presentations. <laughs> I've done so many, I, I lose track. Um, and that's great. We will happily give, especially if we do it online video so we don't have to travel, we can easily give a presentation to your group about our research and our findings if you want us to. Um, help lots of other groups order spiny wipes. Um, one group paid for a billboard um, with our, our outreach message. Um, other websites are helping out. So this is, I mean, we've spent a whole year doing just outreach stuff. And um, the you know person months of time to do this, but that's the important thing. Our research findings are meaningless unless they get out there and change people's behavior. We need anglers to take action and pay attention to what's on their lines, especially the ones who are like, oh, I got skunked in this lake. I'm gonna. It's lunchtime. We're gonna go. We're gonna eat lunch. We're gonna go to this other lake over here. Well, you know, those are the ones you really worry about, where people are moving between lakes within the same day or within just a day or two of each other because the spiny water fleas can survive um, for a little bit outside of water. And that's something we actually don't know exactly how long they can because it's very weather dependent. Um, but that's what you worry about, that spread. Because what I didn't say is female spiny water fleas are parthenogenic. That means they don't need a guy to make babies. Um, and so one female with the, the egg she already has can start a new population in a lake. It's, you know, it's that easy. It doesn't always happen. You know, a lot of times that first female is going to die, but you, populations can be started by just one female all by herself. Um, the other thing, if you're talking to people about spiny water flea and they say, oh, well, they say this lake is invaded, but I didn't see any. Well, spiny water fleas go through real boom and bust cycles throughout the season. And so you, you were fishing uh, right in here, you might not see them, but you come back a month later and holy moly, they're all over the place. So just because nobody's seen them in the water column, especially at the beginning of the summer, it's just because you're in a population trough, doesn't mean they're not there. Um, and they overwinter as these little eggs that are down in the sediment and then get going. And so as they grow and mature, this is a mature female. She has three barbs on her spine. And the more barbs a spiny water flea has, the more easily entangled they are on the fishing line, which means the reproductively mature females are the most likely ones to get entangled on the fishing lines and hence the, the, the worry about the spread. So this has taken a ton of people to do the research. Um, 
and process all the samples and count hundreds and hundreds of spiny water fleas. Um, so just a big thank you to all the crews who, who worked on this uh, and to our funders, St. Louis County and NACERC. And with that, um, I can take questions. All right. Thank you, Val. That was great. Um, and we do have a handful of questions. Um, can I kick it off with this one? So how long do spiny water fleas survive out of the water? And, and that's where I, I hedged on that one because um, we have, as far as we know, nobody has done that research, partly because it's very temperature and humidity dependent. And if there's any little bits of water left, they'd survive even longer. So what we know is that we can kill them with six hours of complete dryness. So if you can get all your gear completely dry and leave it completely dry for six hours, we know that will kill them. How long they can survive in higher temperature and lower humidity, they won't survive as long. Cooler temperatures with um, high humidity or you know just drizzle or whatever, they could survive potentially for days. We just don't know. And that's where it's so you know dangerous to have gear going from lake to lake, especially in the spring and fall when you're more likely, likely to get those cool, humid days. Uh, how did spiny water fleas get to Minnesota? Was it ballast water? It was ballast water. They're Eurasian. Um, and they first came in probably to the harbor and then into Lake Superior and then have jumped to the inland lakes. So they've been around here, I'm trying to remember, mid 80s, I believe. Um, so, and but actually that's a very interesting question because Don Brandstrader has been doing some research and he's finding spines down in the sediment much deeper than you would expect if they'd only been here for 30 years. And so we're, it's a little, the science is a little confused at that point, but they are Eurasian. They came here from, from across the sea and now we are spreading them around to the inland lakes. Uh, can you talk a little bit about when you're cleaning them off the lines, do the little spines, do they hurt people? Are they, do they pose any threat to people? And then like when you're cleaning them, are you squishing them? Do you, do, are you killing the spiny water fleas kind of as you're wiping, off, wiping them off your line? You might be killing them as you wipe them off the line. If you're doing this as you should right at the boat launch before you leave the lake, then we're not worried about it because this lake's already infested. The lake you're in is already infested. And so it really doesn't matter whether they die or not. You're not gonna kill enough of them to make any difference. So don't worry about that. They cannot hurt you. Um, while the spines are harmful for, to fish that are this big, they cannot poke our skin. We have handled dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of spiny water fleas and never been poked. Um, I suppose they can irritate your throat should you choose to drink them. Um, don't recommend that because there's probably other things in the lake water that would make you much more sick than spiny water fleas, um, like giardia and things like that. So, um, so no, no worries there. Not gonna harm you hard on fish. Um, this might be a good or a better question for Meg, but how do people order these spiny wipes? Can people order these spiny wipes? So unfortunately, individuals cannot. These need to be group orders. And if you go to the stopspiny.org website, there is um, there's instructions there for how groups can place a group order. But these are being sort of ordered and printed in real time now. And so you need like a minimum, I think, of probably like 500 or something like that um, spiny wipes to be ordered by a group. And they cost, I'm trying to remember what the cost is, they cost a dollar to a dollar fifty. Um, when you order in bulk. So if you were to order just one, it would probably cost like six bucks if you could even get it done. So we, we didn't go that route. Yeah. I guess I'll add, so our, the design for the spiny wipes is available on the website. Um, and you can add in your logo, your organization's logo to the design. Um, and then you can, like your organization can do the print order yourself. Um, so Macer no longer really needs to be involved. You're welcome to download the template that we've made, add your own logo, and then sort of go from there and do your own order. Um, we're, we're just very excited to get the message out. So we're happy to share our design with everyone. And it's publicly funded. So 
Yes, we need to show. <laughs> Are there other questions? I saw something come through on chat, but I think there were probably others ahead of it in the Q&A. Oh, yes, we have lots of questions. Um, let's see here. Um, are you able to use transmission maps to predict where future infestations may occur? Um, to some extent. So my uh, colleague, Josh Dumke, created um, spread maps for a bunch of invasive species for St. Louis County. It was funded by St. Louis County. Um, what we found is, and you, so you can do this yourself, is that the, the lakes that get the highest angler traffic are the most likely to be invaded. And then especially we're gonna be those Northern lakes that are clear water, cooler water. So, you, so we're working on those sorts of models. Um, we don't have them yet for the whole state, but, um, um, and the, somebody else asked about monitoring and um, the DNR monitors the Sentinel Lakes. Um, but as far as we know, there's no, so those are the some eight or nine biggest lakes in Minnesota that have nice fish populations that anglers are interested in. But as far as we know, there's no systematic monitoring of the lakes for in Minnesota for spiny water fleas. So we're counting on, citizens noticing them on their angling lines and reporting them to the DNR um, to, to help figure out where they're spreading next. But it is, it is humans and so it's human use, particularly angler use of these lakes. They don't tend to get on, because they're not down, they're not right up at the very surface, they don't tend to get on the hull of your boat or things like that. They're going to be on those things that are down deeper in the water column. And so that's where we were concerned about anchor ropes and angling lines and things like that. And it turns out the angling lines are the ones to really pay attention to. Um, is there any research being done to determine what lake conditions would make said lakes most vulnerable to a spiny water flea infestation to help those lake managers focus their education and outreach efforts? Um, uh, Natalie says it appears that eutrophic lakes are less vulnerable. Would you agree with that? That seems to be what the research shows, but we would need Don Brandstrader to, to answer that specifically. I mean, what we what we know is that they tend we tend to find them in the more oligotrophic, mesotrophic lakes. Um, so the ones that are less nutrient impacted, the ones that are farther north, clearer, colder. Um, they this is one thing I, I didn't mention. They themselves, these little spiny water fleas, they themselves are predators on smaller zooplankton and they are visual predators. So if a lake has really poor water clarity, they themselves, these spiny water fleas themselves may have trouble finding food. And so that may be part of why they're um, in these clearer lakes. Um, and again, in terms of which lakes are most vulnerable. So if you think lake in the Northern half of the state that's in pretty good condition, that has a lot of boat traffic to and from it, those are the lakes that are going to, to really be um, vulnerable, especially boat traffic from other areas. You know, if it's, a, if it's a lake that's all privately owned and everybody just keeps their boats on the lake all the time, that's much less vulnerability than lakes that have a lot of public access and the public coming from other lakes that may, may be infested. Those lakes are in the northern part of the state are pretty highly vulnerable. Um, I'm going to combine a couple of questions here. Um, so do any fish eat spiny water fleas and which ones? And then um, can spiny water fleas be eliminated from a lake? And if so, how? I'll answer the second one first. No, they can't. <laughs> we have not figured that out. I mean, you think about zebra mussels too. You know, we just now came up with a virus after 40 years of looking, we've come up with a virus that seems to be really specific to zebra mussels and that took us 40 years. We're much farther behind on the research on spiny water fleas and I don't even know if anybody's looking for that sort of thing. So basically the answer is once they're there, you're stuck with them, um, which is unfortunate for the lakes. Um, a fish, yes. So fish do eat them. Um, it's hard on them. So we, I don't remember which species, some fish, I know there's a few fish that can like grab them, manipulate them in their mouth and then bite the spine off. That takes them like 15 seconds. I mean, you think of a fish being able to gulp down zooplankton and it takes it 15 seconds to eat or something like that, to eat each one. So it's a much slower um, ability for it to eat its food. 
And then other fish try to swallow them whole and you find the fish with like the, the spines actually sticking through their throats and sticking through their stomachs. So they do eat them. It's, it cannot be their preferred food, not with that level of problems. Um, can you talk a little bit about the life cycle of a spinies? I know it can take a couple different routes depending on its reproductive cycle, but can you expand a little bit? Sure. So during the summertime, the females re reproduce parthenogenically, which means they can just make babies that are clones of themselves. They carry them in a brood sack on their back. Um, and it depends on water temperature and food supply, how rapidly the population can increase. We believe that the, the peaks and valleys are based on just, they, they build up really high, run out of food, <laughs> the population crash. Then when the food, uh, food supply catches up, then they can reproduce more again and more survive and population crash. As we get into the fall, um, and the water temperatures start to cool down and move to winter, they need to produce their overwintering eggs. Their, um, and those can only be produced with males. And so then the females will actually have some of the, the young be males. And then the males are in the population, they can mate with the females and um, you create the, the resting eggs, um, which can overwinter in the sediments. And it takes a while for them to get going in the spring. It seems to, they need the warmer water and for the other zooplankton populations that they're gonna feed on um, to build up in the water column before they can really get going. So I hope that answers the question well enough. I'm not, Don Brandstrader is much more expert on the, the ins and outs of the reproductive cycle than I am. Um, let, can we talk a little bit about, um, boundary waters and spiny water fleas. Um, so we have a couple comments from Hans. First about uh, anchor lines. And I know you mentioned this a little bit. Could you expand a little bit again on um, anchor lines and kind of what your assumption was and what the data showed? Maybe just recap that again. Sure. So going into this, I thought that anchor ropes were gonna be our Achilles heel, that nobody was paying attention to anchor ropes. They're hard to clean. They're these gnarly things that we leave coiled up in the water puddle in the bottom of the boat. So anything that's on them could survive till the next time the boat's put in the water. Um, we did not find that. Uh, we don't know why. Now we only tested these in still water and there's other people have raised questions about, well, what if somebody's anchored in a flowage where you're getting water flowing past the anchor lines? Could the spiny water fleas attach the anchor lines then? The answer is they could, we don't know if they will. We, we did not test that. And so scientifically, I cannot say, but it's entirely possible. And we can tell you how to do this study. This only takes a magnifying lamp. You can see these, these critters with a magnifying lamp. You, you can easily identify them. There's nothing else out there that looks like them. So if you're curious about this and you wanna set up a study and some people have talked about this, Don and I can help you do that. Um, this is not, much as I'd love to, as a PhD scientist who worked really hard for my degree, love to say this, but this is literally not rocket science. You can do this. Um, but so what I can say is, if there could be a risk there that we do not know about. Our study just tested the ropes in still water in these two lakes that weren't, didn't have much current. So that's all we can say. We didn't find them in that situation. And we left the ropes in the lakes for hours. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the kind of the second part of that is what outreach is being done to spread, to stop the spread of spiny water fleas in the boundary waters by canoeists. Um, so, oh, I wish Meg was here. I know, I, know. She, <laughs> I know she's been in contact with some of the groups up there and worked with them on modifying our message to make it clear that canoes could be a problem too. Um, again, less likely to be a problem unless they've got angling lines out or something that goes deeper in the water. We don't seem to get these, you know, sticking to the hulls of boats and paddles and things. That's just not, not what happens. That because they entangle more with the spines on rough things like ropes and lines and things like that, um, especially it's thin angling lines. Um, however, that's not to say that it's not existed. The, the unfortunate part about the boundary waters is that so many of those lakes are chains and they're all connected by flowages and these are plankton. 
they're going to float downstream. And so it's quite possible that they'll spread widely once they're in one lake just by flowing downstream naturally with the current to all the lakes that are downstream of that. So that's another, um, that makes it a lot more difficult in some areas of the boundary waters to protect those lakes. Um, I will add that a lot of our outreach that we did advertising wise was specifically targeted to northern Minnesota um, in the Boundary Waters area and also kind of the arrowhead of Minnesota. Um, we did some Facebook targeted advertising specifically. Um, we could geo filter our um, advertising around areas that we knew had spiny water fleet infestations so that uh, video that Val played, we targeted it targeted it on Facebook to play in areas. Um, and I know folks will probably say, well, not everyone in Northern Minnesota has Facebook or an internet connection, but um, we were doing Facebook advertisements. And then we also did print advertisements in the Ely summer times this year. Um, we had a print advertisement in there and then the Northern Wilds magazine that runs um, print advertisements along the North shore and then also on their website as well. Um, in the Duluth News Tribune, Outdoor News. So we were the Lake Superior Angler. We had a feature article. So we were really trying to hit it hard in Northern Minnesota to um, share best practices and information on this study. So we were really trying to focus on Northern Minnesota. Um, so I just wanted to throw that, that tidbit out there. Yep, and, and we're hoping too that, you know, the outfitters are going to get on board and start saying, hey, you know, you need to watch out for this, you need to be careful with your angling lines and, you know, and we know that canoeists will move between lakes, especially if the fishing's not good. Um, so they're going at some entry point, go to their first lake, fishing's not good, they're going to bounce to another lake, set up a new camp. So we're hoping that the, that the outfitters will start helping us spread the message as well as we get the word out to them. It's going to take all of us working together to get the word out. Yes. We have a couple minutes left, so I'm going to hop through some of these. Um, how long does an individual spiny water flea live, would you guess? Out of water or just in general? Uh, in general. In general? Yeah, I don't think they live too long. Um, I actually don't know the answer to that question, but my, my guess is just a few weeks. Um, they go through their reproductive cycle and they go through multiple generations in, um, in a summer. So, you know, a few weeks to a month would be my guess, but that's off the top of my head. We need to ask Don Brenstra for that question. And then just to confirm, spiny water fleas live in both still and flowing water, correct? They do not do well in flowing water. No zooplankton uh, do well in flowing water because they're plankton. Um, and so they can't, they're not big enough to swim against the, against the currents. So while they can be transported uh, by currents from place to place, they're going to do best in still or very slow moving waters, you know, maybe in bigger river, those big slow rivers in areas like that and flow, slow flowages. But in general, you know, fast flowing streams, you, you don't find plankton, period. Okay. Uh, and then we have how much pressure is needed to damage or kill spiner, spiny water fleas when you're using the wipes? Well, again, we're not worried about killing them. I mean, they're pretty damn delicate. <laughs> <laughs> you're probably going to accidentally kill most of them, even if you're not trying to. Um, they're squishy, except for their spine. So pretty easily killed. Um, and if you dry, but you know, you might not kill their eggs. So that's where this gets difficult. Um, and that's where we've emphasized the, the physical removal and the drying. If you're doing it at the boat launch or before you leave the infested lake area, then you don't have to worry about it because the lake's already infested. Um, if you're someplace else, then I would recommend you're way up on dry land, way away from everything, cleaning things off into an area that you know is not gonna get rain runoff into some other water body where you, they, they're gonna be contained until those critters actually dry out and die and all their eggs dry out and die. And again, that's six hours completely dry. Eggs, adults, they'll be dead. Okay. Uh, Doug, thanks Doug. Doug hopped in he said, females generally live for uh, a couple weeks and they have three broods per season. Thanks Doug. <laughs> and are we getting all the ones in the chat too? 
Are we even going to get there? Yeah, <laughs> uh, I don't know if we're going to get there. We're, we're oh, we are at time. Okay. Um, does well, the I want to answer the one about the Metro Lakes really quickly. Um, okay. So what I would recommend, um, we, we're trying to concentrate the wipes in areas where people really need them. But what we need in the Metro area and the more Southern Lakes is high vigilance, people looking at their lines so that as soon as we see that they're starting to spread we, down there, we can jump on it. Everybody needs to clean everything. And you can, you don't need a, you don't need our spiny wipe to clean your lines off. Any cloth will do. Just run your line through a cloth, that last reel in of the day, wipe it down good, and you've got them. You'll see them on your line if you look for them. So, so anybody can do that. You don't need a special spiny wipe. It was just an easy way for us to get the word out with instructions all over it, printed all over it, but any cloth will do. Uh, did you want to add anything everybody. else? Pardon? Did you want to add anything else? No, just thanks everybody. And please help us spread the word. Visit the website. Um, you can download lots of information and you know, if you have ways of getting the word out to people, make use of all the tools on our website. They're free for you to use. Meg and Kristen worked really hard on that um, so that they're accurate and easy. And with that, I can uh, stop sharing here and take questions. I mean, if we don't get through all the questions, my contact information and Don's are on the Maastricht website. Feel free to reach out to us, send us an email. We will do our best to answer all your questions. All right, thank you so much. That was amazing. Um, a reminder folks, if you have questions, go ahead, tap that Q&A button at the bottom and then type them out and we will ask them to Val as we go. Uh, we'll kick things off with how long do spiny water fleas survive out of water? You kind of talked about this with the gear, but if you take a spiny water flea out, drop it on, you know, a table, how long is it going to live? And that probably depends on what the temperature is and how much humidity is in the air and if there's any film of water on said table, right? Um, and as far as we know, this has not been rigorously tested. We uh, don't see, any, Don and I don't see anything in the literature and we have not been able to find funding to do this research ourselves. So we don't know how long they survive out of water under various conditions and how that differs between the adult female and the eggs that are encased in her brood sac. So maybe she dies, but her eggs stay alive longer. And again, it, cool temperatures, humid conditions, it's going to be much longer than, you know, the baking desert sun kind of idea where, where it's really dry. But Don Brandstrader has done the tests that show that six hours will, of complete dryness will kill both the adults and the eggs. And so that's what we tell everybody, just try to make everything dry in the sun for six hours. Um, all right. Another question here, do we know the full outcome after spiny water flea has been well established? Sorry, I'm just reading this on the fly. Mm -hmm. um, has there been other observations outside of decreasing walleye sizes? So this is kind of referencing uh, Gretchen Hansen's study a little bit. Right. So there hasn't been a lot of work on this. So there's been a little bit. So Kerfoot has done some. Um, you see, he was over at Michigan Tech. I think he's retired by now. Um, but there's, there's been a little bit, but it's been much easier to show impacts on zooplankton, um, other zooplankton communities than it has been to show effects on fish, just because there's so many other things that can affect fish growth and population size. And so that's been very difficult for us to nail down. And it requires big sample sizes, us to be able to sample a whole bunch of lakes that are and are not invaded to be able to control for all the other things that can affect fish populations. Um, so we're slowly piecing together that information, but we don't have very much yet. It's hard to prove. Gotcha. Um... So outside of walleye populations and sizes going down, do spiny water flea have any other um, specific impacts that we know of? Um, 
they found some things for yellow perch growth. So okay. stunting, stunting yellow perch growth. Um, like I said, it, it's hard to prove because there are so many other variables you have to control for, but the logic is there. If you have really high uh, uh, spiny water flea populations and they're eating the same zooplankton that the same other zooplankton that the baby fish need to eat and the young small fish can't eat spiny water fleas very well, you, it logic says you're going to have a problem. Um, proving, proving it and ruling out all the other factors is, mu is more difficult. So, and we'd like to be able to just avoid this whole thing <laughs> by not having them in the lakes at all, because we, we can't get rid of them in the lakes. We don't have a magic bullet that just kills spiny water fleas without taking everything else out with them. Uh, what's next for this study? What, what are we doing now? <laughs> Uh, well, so we are pretty much done. However, um, there's been, we would like to, well, how do I start this? Okay, so as I said, there's no statewide surveillance for spiny water flea. The DNR um, survey the Sentinel Lakes, which are the, you know, the, I don't know, nine or a dozen, whatever it is, biggest lakes in Minnesota that have the really nice fish populations that we all care about. So those are monitored. But for the rest of the state, it, we're relying on just you know, anecdotal evidence, people seeing them. It would be nice to start um, to, for citizens to be able to better like go out and sample a lake that they're curious about and that they're worried about and see if they can find spiny water fleet. So we're working on figuring out how we can equip, um, easily, cheaply equip just citizen groups to be able to keep an eye on the lakes that they care about and report to the DNR if they find spiny water fleet. And so we're, we're um, I think that's gonna be our next step is to empower citizen groups and lake associations to be able to do this kind of thing. So in this study, we did a lot of different research uh, outreach. We did radio ads, Facebook ads, print ads, um, video ads. I mean, we did a, we did a lot of different um, outreach. And I promise I won't take this personally, your answer, but is there one that you would not do again? Or what one did you think was most effective um, that you can share with participants if they're trying to do some AIS outreach on their own? Oh, I really have no idea because I'm, <laughs> I'm terrible at social media. So I'm not, I'm like literally not on Facebook and Twitter. Um, you know, so I think it depends on I think we, I, I personally think we need to do a lot of different things because different things reach different types of people. You know, um, the, the grandpa types might be watching the fishing shows on TV and that's where we need PSA ads to be run. Whereas the younger anglers may be all over Facebook and Twitter and that's where they will only see the message there because they're not sitting in front of the TV like, like, you know, we all used to in the old days. So I do think that we need it in as many places as possible. And I do think we need to then empower other people like we've done with our website to be able to spread the word themselves, um, not just relying on us to do all the word spreading because it's gonna take all of us. So, but what I would like to see is, I know you've, you've talked about having time to like dive into the metrics more and try to figure out, you know, what is driving traffic to our website, which types of ads. Are driving traffic to our website and I think that would be um, interesting to know and you know and again you, you always have to weigh cost effectiveness like the TV PSA has cost us a lot more money than Facebook and Twitter ads cost us and so how does that but there but TV can have a huge audience so you know how do how do those things compare in terms of cost efficiency absolutely um... We still have a little bit of time. So if you have any questions, pop them into that Q&A. Um, but before we go, Val, any kind of final thoughts on the spread of spiny water fleas and kind of what you see for the next couple years in Minnesota? Well, I'm afraid that they've been spreading you know, kind of secretly, <laughs> like nobody's noticing because they're little, they're, they're zooplankton. You know, you can see them with the naked eye, but you got to look for them. Um, and so it, I would urge everyone when you're out fishing, you know, really keep an eye on your line, keep an eye on your gear, 
Because if you even see one, that means there's probably millions in the lake. Um, and we need to report those to the DNR. And so you can go on the DNR Aquatic Invasive Species page and report sightings, new sightings of aquatic invasive species. And so please keep an eye on that and do that. Another question you might get is, oh, ducks spread them on their feet and in their feathers. You know, we, it's not gonna make any difference what we anglers do. That's actually not true. And we can prove it because <laughs> ducks fly everywhere. And so if they were being spread by ducks, the, it wouldn't matter whether lakes have public access or not, spiny water flea could be there. But what we see is the highest, the lakes that have the greatest risk of having spiny water flea are the ones that have the big boat launches and the high fishing pressure and the public boat launches, not the ones where there's no public boat launch and it's all just the people who live on the lake and keep their boat in the lake all year and only fish that lake. Um, and so there's a very high correlation between public access and amount of boat, public, public boat traffic to a lake and risk of having spiny water fleas. And so to me, that says very clearly, it's not the ducks. Ducks don't, ducks aren't going to public accesses. <laughs> they don't need public accesses. <laughs> so yes, maybe there are very few lakes that got um, spiny water fleas to them by ducks, but mostly it's us. It's mostly us. And so therefore it's like only you can prevent forest fire. Only we, we are the key <laughs> to preventing spread of spiny water flea around the state and having this critter everywhere that we don't want it to be. Um, another question we had last time was about why aren't they on anchor ropes? One thing we did not test is, it, is anchor ropes in flowing water, in flowages and things like that. So our anchor ropes were in still water in lakes and maybe it would be different. We found almost none on anchor ropes. Like I think we found like one on 40 or 50 anchor ropes we looked at. Um, but maybe we would be different in flowing water. We have not done that test. This could be a citizen science test. Don and I can tell you how to do this. All you need are anchor ropes, cement, can little cans of cement to hold them to the on the bottom, little floats, and a magnifying lamp. And you two could do this test and tell us whether or not spiny water fleas are collecting on anchor lines that are actually in flowing water. Um, typically, plankton don't do well in flowing water, especially fast flowing water. But during flow in flowages from you know one lake to another, they could be in that flowage water. And that's where perhaps they could get on anchor line and be more readily transferred from lake to lake. And that's a question we do not know the answer to. Uh, you mentioned him, but I don't know if we talked about him before. Who is Don? Oh, sorry. So Don Brandstrader is my co-PI and unfortunately he can't be here because he's like out west, which, oh well. Um, but he is like Mr. Spiny Water Flea, for, at least for Minnesota. He, he has been doing spiny water flea research for decades. He knows all the ins and outs of all their life cycles and everything about them. I'm a more of a generalist for aquatic, aquatic invertebrates and zooplankton. And so I know some, he knows all the details. So if you have a really detailed question about spiny water flea biology or physiology, you should direct it to him, not to me, because I won't, I'll just, I'll just forward the email. <laughs> Well, this was fantastic. I'm not seeing any more questions in the q and I think that's probably because we had so many in that first session. Um, we, we had a lot of questions in the first one. Um, 